Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper and welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcast from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii and Juana Nui Kea. Today, we're at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Conference of Parties 28 session. And we're looking at the most important basic human rights that illustrate the interconnectedness of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. We're looking at the right to freedom of movement and residence, Article 13, the human right to return to one's homeland. We're exploring the existential climate change crisis with a Pacific perspective from COP1 in Berlin to COP28 in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Today, we're joined by Rex. Rex, thank you so much for participating and more importantly, a lifetime of service to make sure the Pacific voice is heard at the climate summits. Greetings. Greetings from the Pacific, but I'm in Dubai, COP28. Thank you, Joshua, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, we are able to connect. And uh, this connection that we have is to connect with the world and humanity and what is an existential threat to the global community the climate crisis. It is a global problem that demands a global solution. Uh, let's get on to the questions that you may have and how we may be able to explain to our audience who are listening around the world and uh, in the Pacific region, the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, uh, in particular, the small island developing states, which we would like them to be the big ocean states because of their huge uh, EEZs. Really good point for looking at the, their economic zones, as you're describing. What's also important, though, when people talk about human rights, is I really think it's important the way the Pacific sees them and also your perspective of what you think is so valuable. Human rights really do boil down to the right to clean air, the right to water, and the right to food. Can you expand on that? Yes. Uh, climate change is basically uh, impacting on the uh, uh, our daily lives. And uh, uh, in order to explain it to, let's say, uh, children and uh, 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 kids around the world, it is about the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. Climate change has no borders because it impacts across. So if it impacts the air you breathe, the pollution that, uh, you know, the uh, carbon dioxide and the, the trucks and the uh, fossil fuel is uh, polluting the air, then uh, you'll be breathing uh, polluted air. If the water is polluted, you are drinking polluted water. And if the food is... Uh, uh, um, it's also polluted. Then uh, the the far the farm products, the uh, the the water, the sea uh, where you get your fish, and uh, uh, all the uh, across the uh, uh, across the the, the 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 sea and the land, uh, food, water, and air are impacted upon, and that is as 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 simple as you can put it. On the global scale, we are looking at how uh, the impacts of climate change in terms of the uh, uh, the, the sea shores and the, the land, the erosion, and all of that. So um, uh, it is really the uh, the daily lives of uh, people that uh, is impacted upon. And uh, uh, and as water is a human right, or food is human right, and the um, uh, the air we breathe in is human right, then uh, that's an impact. Uh, we'll get on to the migration and the uh, how the, the, the threat, uh, the climate crisis affects uh, uh, nations that had to move because of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the sea level rise and all of that. Uh, that's basically what it is, uh, Joshua, in terms of the... Uh, how it impacts on our daily lives. And the small Curious. island states are more impacted upon because they are small. 
and ecologically uh, vulnerable. That's a great point. And it's also the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does guarantee people around the world a framework available to assist with all existential crises facing humanity. And the UDHR was drafted and adopted in 1940 in Paris, and it did rise out of the ashes of the Holocaust, but it's still applicable with new emerging challenges that you were sharing. But it goes back to those core aspects of right to clean air, right to food, and of course, water, as we need all those to basically survive. So that sustainable environment is crucial, and the ability for us to participate in politics to guarantee those rights is really at the core of at the COP. Correct, correct. So the uh, the COP process uh, uh, is a government uh, process, and because it's a government process, it it, it, it takes time uh, to negotiate, uh, you know, agreement on adaptation, mitigation, and financing, and collaboration, research, and all of that. So the COP. Uh, the the conference of the party process is you know ten or more years behind reality, and also the COP process is a government consensus process, and therefore it is slow, and uh, arduous. So we are now in COP twenty eight, and we're still talking about the same issues about adaptation, mitigation, collaboration, and financing. And I think in COP28, uh, taking the stock take, you have the Paris Agreement, you have the Glasgow Pact, and uh, we now, uh, last year, we had the loss and damage in uh, uh, agreed to uh, to set up a fund for loss and damage for small island developing states, which we want to transform to the big ocean states because of their EEZs and their large oceans, uh, so they are not victims of the, uh, 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 of, of, of the, uh, the crisis, but they are uh, the big ocean states with the uh, uh, fishery resources and uh, uh, other marine resources that exist there, so EEZs of the big ocean states are critical. And uh, we want to uh, save the oceans to save humanity or save humanity by saving the health of the oceans. Because the health of the oceans, uh, the five oceans of the world, 71% uh, of the Earth's surface uh, is oceans, water, uh, lakes, watersheds, and rivers and lakes. All of that uh, contribute to the uh, the water resources that uh, the world needs. So the health of the oceans is critical for the health of humanity. And uh, the, uh, the Pacific Ocean as the ocean of peace, we want the five oceans as oceans for peace, in inclusive of the five oceans. Saving those five oceans is to save the health of humanity. No, oh, that's a really good point. And what is so crucial, I believe, about your perspective is you were at COP1, the first COP ever in Berlin. Can you describe yes. what COP1 was like and looking yes. at it now for COP28? Yes. Yeah, COP1, uh, it was an emotional uh, uh, impact on uh, the small island uh, developing states in Berlin in '95. What we were asking for was uh, the, the the AOSIS Alliance of Small Island States um, would like to have a twenty percent reduction to the nineteen ninety levels. That was the cry in um, COP one. That uh, we requested the annex one parties, uh, those that pollute the um, started the pollution of the the, the earth, uh, should reduce their emissions by twenty percent. So that was a big a big big ask to have annex one parties to reduce their emissions to the nineteen ninety levels by twenty percent. As well, the Alliance of Small Island States uh, have the emotional impact to say that because we are frontline states, that we will be uh, mostly affected, most affected, although we contribute less to the uh, pollution of the world, 
we are the first ones to be impacted upon, and therefore uh, we regard ourselves, the analogy we used uh, 27 years ago, 28 years ago, was that small island developing states are canneries in a coal mine. And that is the image that uh, we had then. So over the last 27 years, now 28 years later, we are still discussing the issues that uh, uh, have been on the agenda for a long time. And uh, the main, the main uh, the, uh, issue now is financing. And uh, the global community need, uh, uh, needs to work together with uh, the different sectors, the private sector, civil society, and the governments need to work together to have the enabling environment to raise the funds to uh, uh, mitigate, adapt, and collaborate uh, in order to address the key issues that uh, we are facing in terms of human rights of all uh, people in the world, in, in particular, the indigenous rights. People uh, in indigenous communities who are custodians of their own resources, you know, have been impacted upon, and the small island states, the water, the water, say, in Kiribati, they had to use the same water that they wash their dishes, they recycle that uh, to also have a shower and then wash dishes and then dispose the water into the garden uh, for the, lit the plants and the crops that they want to grow. So uh, six buckets of water can be used by a family of, say, 10 to 15, and uh, they had to fetch the water and at the same time try and uh, use the, the, the same amount of water to do the dishes and uh, bathe with that, as well as putting the water at the end uh, into the plants and the gardens around their houses. So that's how important water is and uh, which is part of human rights. No, it's a really good point. And as you were at COP1 and now you see COP28, supposedly it's the highest number of people here. Maybe you could share a bit about what you see around this COP28 in Dubai and what is going forward as humanity. Yeah, the, in COP28, the big difference now is that you have more people participating in the, uh, the COP process. Uh, for example, uh, today I was at the, uh, the main plenary where you have the indigenous people uh, talking and you have women and uh, young people gathering together in the whole. So uh, at least you would have something like, uh, uh, you know, couple of thousand people uh, that, that are in this big hall, and they were able to express themselves through a, a structured way, but uh, people listening and uh, uh, yelling and uh, agreeing to the speakers and uh, the advocates, the campaigners are all in the room uh, trying to have their voices heard. And I think there are more voices today than there were in the previous COPs. So uh, COP28 really marks a, a huge number of uh, young people getting involved. The youth are getting involved, the women, the indigenous people, the people whose rights have been denied in the previous years, so now their voices uh, are being heard. And I think that is uh, the biggest uh, difference I see between COP1 and COP28. The largest number attending this uh, COP28 is in the in thousands. I, I I heard a number from 75 to 79 thousand people gathered in Dubai COP28. And it's true. It's there's so many aspects, as you said. There's the when you first walk in, there's those two giant buildings, the B1, with halls that sit thousands of people. And then if you keep yes. walking, you then see up to B7. And each B7 is just an area. And then there's buildings. All these buildings are yes. 89, 86. There's pavilions. Then on those pavilions, there's booths. And you were yesterday speaking on a, in Monash. 
What were some of the topics that you were looking at at the Monash University booth? And what were some of the discussions that were pertinent to the people of the Pacific and all those caring about our beautiful planet? Yes, there's a, a whole series there uh, from youth uh, gatherings and uh, in one of the, uh, uh, I think on day eight, uh, on the 8th of December, uh, the youth uh, were there in numbers. Uh, I think there were at least uh, three or four groups of youth coming in to express their their place in the uh, stage. So uh, Monas hosted uh, the youth as well as Monas hosted yesterday was the uh, oceans. Uh, the Pacific Island nations were there with the Caribbean nations to try and articulate the uh, the need to uh, 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 to protect the oceans because they depend on it, and uh, uh, also to address the question of uh, small island developing states to become the uh, uh, um, big ocean states because of their EEZs and uh, taking care of the five oceans and their health is taking care of the health of humanity as well as uh, the health of the Pacific. Uh, depends on the Pacific Ocean, uh, its health and uh, pr uh, protection and uh, management of uh, uh, the resources in the uh, in the ocean, like tuna, because the Pacific houses uh, uh, at least sixty percent of the tuna resources in the world. So, so Monas uh, uh, has a, a, a big delegation, uh, uh, and they have they uh, had a uh, pavilion, Monas pavilion in the blue zone, uh, that uh, has been managed by a, a, a group of uh, the program designers for Monas, hosting so many uh, uh, panels of discussion from sustainable development, climate change reduction of poverty and having you, uh, young people, youth, to have their voices heard. And uh, the, the, the whole range of uh, 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 participants as well as uh, organizers of the, uh, of the, uh, the Monash uh, pa uh, uh, Pavilion. Uh, we have uh, Associated Professor uh, Susie Ho, uh, Professor uh, Sally Bouch, Bouch and uh, we uh, have a whole uh, team there. Doc, uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin Thompson, who was also quite key in um, the, the organization and the whole team uh, of uh, Monash uh, professors and uh, associated professors and doctors and uh, the whole team there. So. I was pleased that uh, uh, Monash uh, uh, is, um, is a picture there, and we have a high side professor, Paris Narayan, uh, who uh, spoke and delivered a team from Fiji in um, uh, climate accounting, and that is critical, a new area that has come up now in the, uh, the stage, climate accounting. And uh, this is a, a unique uh, feature of the uh, the the island nations uh, moving forward to so Professor Paresh Narayan with a team uh, uh, from Fiji uh, uh, coming to uh, to explain what uh, climate accounting is and what the potential is there is. So it's a whole host of things. So I, I think COP28 has more to say about the world. Uh, but we uh, we still need to do more. Uh, in particular, I'm quite concerned about the financing area, Joshua, and we need to work on that. No, there's definitely a lot. And as you look from COP1 to COP27 last year in Sharm El Sheikh, and then this year being there, it really does combine a whole field of human rights defenders. You have academics. You have attorneys, you have activists, and even artists all trying to make sure that the voice of the earth gets out. And as you're describing it, it reminds me of Malama Honua in Hawaii to take care of each other, 
but also take care of our island earth because we understand what it's like to live in a fragile ecosystem. Can you share a bit and what you were describing of when we look at what people are facing with the climate crisis, in a way, yes. it's intangible. It's, you know, you did say, and it is true, we have to look at funds. But the other side is certain things are beyond what the current economic system can absorb. And you are getting to something deeper when we look at how indigenous and Pacific Island peoples are impacted with the climate crisis. Let's take Tuvalu, which is the lowest lying uh, atoll country in the Pacific. So, if Tuvalu uh, uh, suffers from um, sea level rise, the first thing they will have to do is if you relocate the, uh, the people of Tuvalu, uh, that's fine, but then they will leave behind their heritage, the culture, uh, their uh, identity, and the, the that in loss and damage, that is not considered as an asset because you cannot uh, account for it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's non-tangible. They can only account for the tangible things, you know, their houses, their, uh, their uh, buildings, the material wealth they have, but then the, the human non, their consciousness, their being, their identity, that's what the, the loss that uh, cannot be uh, uh, ascertained because it, it, it's, it's non-tangible. Uh, and that is, that is key to relocation of, uh, of communities throughout the Pacific. Now, uh, the biggest help that has come from the region uh, is you have uh, organizations, the crop agencies such as SPREP, SPC, PIFS, Pacific Island Forum and the uh, USP, uh, those crop agencies, the FFA Forum Agency, the the crop agencies in the region are doing their best, and they are the, uh, the, the uh, they do the capacity building. They ensure to build resilience in the countries, and they support the countries to uh, to adapt and uh, build resilience, and uh, also bring in money from uh, other donors. Uh, to support the uh, ODA that the countries get from donors. Uh, and then uh, on top of the ODA is the risk, uh, 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 the additional financing, which is climate change. And I think that's what uh, uh, is being done today. And uh, one of the problems with that is uh, that the donors uh, need to be educated about financing uh, the block grants to support the the cost of climate change as well as the ODA cost rather than uh, uh, working in silos and finance a little bit there in climate change, finance a little bit there in terms of development. Uh, they need to be educated to have a, uh, to treat climate change and development uh, integrated. And therefore, uh, this is where MONAS has come in to help in the interdisciplinary nature of uh, climate change and development. So you have the faculty of architecture, the faculty of uh, sustainable development, uh, and uh, you have engineer, engineers working together with the social scientists and uh, that, uh, and, and the medical doctors working uh, hand in hand with the uh, other faculties to address the the, the health uh, in the, uh, for example, uh, the, there is a, a project in Fiji that's a good example called RISE, R-I-S-E, which is revitalization of uh, informal settlements and other environments. It's a classic interdisciplinary work between uh, the uh, faculty of uh, architecture and engineering and engineers uh, and uh, carpenters and uh, medical uh, professionals uh, working together with uh, uh, FNU, uh, Fiji National University, and uh, uh, the, the local uh, uh, people in Fiji uh, to try and enhance that uh, interdisciplinary work, uh, the biomimicry kind of uh, uh, nature-based solution. And that is quite a a good example of what uh, the universities can do 
interaction with the people. No, that's a really good point. You also point out and illustrate how many more aspects are included. In a way, you're shattering the silos from early on in the COPs and drawing all the connections, and with those connections, showing the consequences. And so when we look at Article 13, it does provide the path for people of the Pacific living on the front lines of climate change to be able to be included. And Article 13 recognizes everyone on Earth has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Thus recognizing each state also has a right to exist. So it's that self-determination <laughs> that all people have the right to exist and are able to be part of the global family or Ohana as we call it. Maybe you can share with us the other aspect that everyone has the right to leave that country, but also be able to return to one's ancestral homeland, noting then that the land must be there forever for people to be able to have these rights. Yes, that's uh, a, a very uh, important point, Joshua. Uh, the, the, the first thing you want to do is if we act now rather than waiting, we may be able to save uh, these apple countries so they don't have to uh, leave their homeland. And therefore, the human rights aspect is quite a critical one. And uh, uh, this is, uh, has to do with the, the respect for human rights and uh, to be compliant and, uh, uh, and respect human rights. Uh, everyone has the right to, to live. And that is the reason why the, the, uh, the, the small island states uh, have a right. Uh, they are ecologically vulnerable, but they are not victims of this crisis. They do not uh, uh, contribute to the crisis in the in a large way as the uh, the biggest states and the annex one parties. Uh, but uh, one thing is, in goodwill and good faith, the small island developing states are working together uh, with the global community and uh, the regional communities to ensure that they also contribute towards adaptation, mitigation, and financing, as well as uh, building resilience. And I think building resilience is fundamental. Uh, you can adapt, but if you, uh, if you don't build resilience, uh, that adaptation uh, can get a shock and uh, uh, you have a lot more problem uh, than being resilient. So resilient is like an athlete uh, uh, building his or her stamina to run a, a distance race uh, and, and therefore you are prepared to withstand shocks or uh, stress. And that uh, uh, stamina, uh, building resilience, is also uh, the same with a, a nation or people uh, working to ensure that uh, their level of resilience is built through capacity building and uh, uh, working on both the, the health and the uh, the physical health of, uh, of of people and the nation, uh, which is part of the human rights uh, and respect for it, that uh, respect for the water they drink, the air they breathe, and the food they uh, they grow and eat. So uh, the interrelatedness of uh, uh, the, the different sectors of society, and uh, therefore you know the whole question of labor force and how labor and the unions uh, need to be respected for what they represent, because their jobs that depend on uh, uh, the employment that they have and the decency of work. And those are elements of uh, human rights, uh, decent work and uh, employment and jobs, job creation is quite critical. And therefore, labor unions, transport, uh, the whole area of transportation is critical, and uh, we need to look at whether transportation on land or at sea or air, uh, we need to uh, reduce emissions and uh, have renewable energy and turn to uh, renewables uh, in order to uh, reduce the use of fossil fuel, and uh, we can transition from fossil fuel to uh, circular carbon economy where uh, we depend uh, on uh, renewables and clean energy. 
those are really good points as we look going forward. And it is important, as you can describe all those different aspects of these rights, can you provide a vision for the future of this important right for migration with Tuvalu uh, and Australia having a recent agreement and other aspects where the people are guaranteed that they'd have a place to live even Fiji, where land was purchased, to make sure that people can have that land, that identity, as you were saying, and that place-based perspective of what matters most, of that collective kuleana or responsibility for one another. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think the, the bigger nations like Fiji, uh, the Australia, and uh, countries like Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, uh, uh, that they also uh, be uh, considerate and uh, to uh, uh, for the re, uh, relocation of uh, the smaller countries, such as Tuvalu and uh, Marshall Islands and uh, Kiribati. Already, the Solomon Islands has uh, relocated uh, Kiribati people back, uh, uh, you know, uh, 50, 60 years ago. We have now a Kiribati community on Wagena in the Solomon Islands. So that is uh, one of the first relocations. But uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu, of course, need to be, uh, we have to have a, uh, 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 be prepared to uh, look after our brothers and sisters if something happens. But we hope that they don't have to move. Uh, but it is important that uh, we we look at the question of uh, migration, uh, relocation. Tuvalu now is looking at different ways of uh, adapting. They even want uh, to turn Tuvalu into a digitized kind of nation where they have their data collected and uh, their identity is being put into a, a computer data system. So if something happened, at least that they have a storage of their history and all of that. So they are thinking ahead. But but we hope uh, nothing uh, uh, drastic will happen. Uh, and therefore, we need to take action now rather than later to save the fiscal uh, islands. And Tuvalu is planning at uh, looking at raising the, uh, the land so that and that will cost quite a bit of money, but uh, you know it, it might be worth it to look at the cost uh, factor of raising Tuvalu to a um, higher ground, so that uh, to avoid sea level rise. <coughs> Great point, Rex, and that really does bring us to where we're at. That <coughs> understanding human rights. It's ten o'clock. To make sure we're looking at human rights for all. We're looking at the issue of migration, but it's that holistic human rights, those inherent rights that we all have from self-determination, but also that right of solidarity we all share to stand up. And we're in the final 24 hours of the negotiations. People say it's 1.5 to stay alive. And based on your perspective of decades of climate change, we appreciate you joining us. And thank you so much for all you do regarding Oceans for Peace.